Um, this is the fifth and final session of the UEFI Mini Summit today. I want to thank you all for being here. Um, the uh, session is uh, UEFI development in an open source ecosystem. Uh, this was originally planned to be done by myself, Michael Crow from Intel, and Vincent Zimmer from Intel. As you can see, Vincent is not here. Um, he couldn't make it, and I'm sorry to say so, because uh, some of this content was originally derived from him and his work, and so knowing that if I get to a point where I don't have an answer and somebody else from Intel who's here does, there may be some um, responsing coming from there. On the other hand, just to let you know, if you have questions or comments or anything during this presentation, feel free to raise your hand and ask them right off the bat rather than waiting or holding to the last minute. Um, <clears throat> this is uh, pretty much what this, this session is about um, and what to expect, what to do. Um, attendees have an opportunity to share and recommendations. Um, that's part of this. I'll make sure that you know this can be an interactive experience. Um, I'm going to start off with a little bit of history of UEFI, a little history of where we came from, because really that is influencing the transitions that we're going through to become an open source uh, environment. Um, and it's easy to study history. It's also easy to look back at history and, and see things that really weren't there at the time, but look that way later. Um, 1998. I picked that year because that's when the Intel boot initiative was underway. The rest of the world, we were at PCI 2.2 spec, USB 1.1. 802.11. 802.11G didn't come until 1999. So, um, in 1998, 92 million PCs were sold. The IA64 was in development. In 1999, 113 million PCs were sold. 98 and 99 were very interesting years of jump. Um, everything that is happening here Intel Boot Initiative, the reason I mention this, is this is the forefather of EFI, which then became UEFI. And the reason I mention IA64 is that is what the Boot Initiative was associated with. So for those of you who don't know all the history, now you've illuminated that. Now, you'll notice the ecosystem was very industrial setting. That means a very conservative mindset and Revolutions are not appreciated. Evolution is anticipated. Um, and in fact, the classic sense of evolution, there are also extinction events and other things that occur within the industry. So, um, and most people don't want to be on that side of the evolutionary curve. So how do we get to the road to open source? From UEFI's point of view, from the point of view of where we started, looking to the future rather than where we are now, or looking at it from the outside, or from the open communities looking at UEFI going, why on earth did they do that? Um, UEFI was actually formed in 2005. So I jumped forward about seven years. Okay, first of all, UEFI is a specification organization. That's what we're focusing on is the specification of how the boot should occur. Um, implementation. Specifics are open to membership. We say how the boot should occur, but there's always room for interpretation, and we've gotten bitten by that. We'll admit that. But we can't tell people how to do their job or how to run their company, so we have to work within that. However, in 2005, the UFI Open Community website was formed. We put the reference implementations of just the UEFI stack up there. Um, originally, it was defined by the community with the UEFI implementations so that we could do evaluation and development of UEFI. So that originally, so that um, IHVs and others could actually write drivers for UEFI for their silicon and in that manner. Um, we had several evaluation or environments to work with, including a couple of uh, a couple of simulation environments, Duet, which said that you could take a legacy BIOS platform, boot it to a UEFI, and then run UEFI in it, the UEFI shell, and, and operate that way natively on the hardware. 
NT32 was a simulation environment that would run on Windows, and you could run, but the problem was Windows protected the hardware, so when, as soon as your UEFI drivers try to talk to the hardware, they get cleaned. We also then moved to EDK, EDK2, which spins off into the UDK, UEFI development kits, uh, 2010, 2014, 2015 is either out or coming out soon. <coughs> OVMF around 2010, which was a um, virtual machine for development of UEFI that was going on. Um, and UEFI at TianaCore.org sort of becomes the de facto implementation that if you're working from that, you're pretty much in alignment with everybody else who's doing UEFI. Over the years, platform impl implementations have moved into TianaCore.org. The Beagle Board around 2011 started. I think Beagle Board Black's up there now. I, I'm not sure. Not okay. And uh, the original Minnow Board around two, uh, 2013, Minnow Board Max in 2014. So, and uh, Beagle Board being an ARM, and Minnow Boards being Intel based systems. Now, we look at our standards. First thing I want to go back to that historical moment is the technology um, with the old legacy firmware was that it became obsolete and problematic. Little things about the original BIOS that the UEFI was replacing at the beginning. In 15 extensions, do you know that even in the 21st century, joystick code was still around in the legacy BIOS for a PC, even in your notebook? OEM specifics for int 15. During the heyday in the 90s of, of legacy BIOS, an OEM would say, I need int 15 function A3 to do something. He would grab it. Now, another manufacturer could try to do the same thing. Who does what with whom? If you have a program that ran on one, it, it got very confusing very quickly. Um, some fun video standards over the years. <laughs> and let's go back to the original AT. Media, audio cassette, MFM disk drives, ESD, SCSI, IDE, floppy SATA. <laughs> you know, these are things that have come. Some of them have come and gone, you know. Um, and yet all this type of stuff is still being carried. It was pagoded into the legacy BIOS over the years. So it was, it was getting messy. So a firmware standard that would allow transition was necessary. And that's where UEFI comes in, where the state of the art is improving, where old things can be taken out, new things can be added in, and done so in a logical and extensible manner. Also, a standard that is defined and revised, eliminate the ambiguity of things. For instance, does anybody know when the first time uh, the AT was actually standardized? It was part of the ESA specification. ESA had to define what the industry standard was before they could extend it. And that's when it actually got written down. Everything else was, well, this is how the original material was done. And then it became, this is how our competitors are doing things. How can we do them better? OK. So you can see it was a very confusing situation that has actually been brought into order. And one of the things bringing into order allows us to create a community around things rather than having everybody trying to find a bigger rock to hit the other person with. Um, the creation of the UEFI Forum Association in 2005, it's been 10 years. We now have 11 promoters, board members, 44 contributors, 208 adopters, 25 individual adopter members, 288 members total. That was as of the time the slide was being done. One of the statements, and this is from Gary Simpson of AMD. I wanted to get somebody else in from another company, and I'm from Intel, so you know, it's like this is somebody that's actually a competitor of my company. His statement about the UEFI forum. You know, you may be assuming that a traditional competitiveness between companies persists in the UEFI forum and the spec groups it oversees. However, there is actually very little of that especially compared to some of the other industry standards. Um, the general attitude with UEFI is that firmware layers should be unified, interoperable, well-specified, and secure. 
There is no room for competition in or company-specific advantage in the firmware layer. If we want to make advantages, let's do it in the hardware. Let's do it after we get the thing booted, not at this point in time. The lessons along the way. With Tianacore.org, we began to understand that our understanding of open source was kind of limited. The idea of just handing the source out to the world and saying it's open source is naive. <laughs> we began to realize that open source is also a matter of tools, process, communication, and community and consensus. Um, open source is not necessary for everybody. We also realize that, that there are some small-scale manufacturers who don't want to get into the source. All they want is a solution quickly. And there are other methodologies that are being developed for that purpose that, that may be a UEFI solution, but may be <laughs> distributed binary. If you hear about binary distribution, that doesn't mean we're turning our back on open source. It means we're talking to another class of user who needs a different solution. The, the, um, the binary distributions will often be based off of the open source sources. It's just they've been provided as binaries because it's easier for these people to work with them. <clears throat> the process goes, EVFI as a forum is opening up. We've realized, hey, you know, we, we are, need to be more open with everyone. We're updating our site layout. We're trying to make space for more information, more communication, not just to members, but to people who are just interested um, and may want to be members or may not. Um, a preview organization of late information so it's easier to find things, easier to look at the specs, um, easier to talk about the specs. Uh, creating additional channels to discuss that is, in fact, one of the clay cases there where we're um, opening up a um, mail list where you can actually, even though you're not a member of UEFI or if you are a member of UEFI, you can discuss what's going on in the spec. You can discuss what's happening. We're also looking at sharing information about things that have been approved for the next best that haven't been published yet, but, it, but have been approved so we can actually talk about them a little bit. And allowing for discussion before the publication of the spec, if there's refinement. If somebody says, did you guys think about this corner case that could totally shake the thing up? We can do so before the spec comes out. Okay, opening further. I can't talk about UEFI without talking about Tianacore.org, um, which is the, the open community, uh, the community open source site for UEFI. The site um, has been upgraded already for some user interface upgrades. We're in a process of actually going from SVN to Git. Um, there's been some slag lagging in that. I wanted to be able to say, we've done it, it's there, it's happening. We're in the process of it. Um, we already have a Git mirror happening, but we want to make it a Git um, standard. One of the things that is slowing that down was the people who were in SVN, when you're moving to Git, you have to balance what people are used to and being able to get their jobs done and moving to what the community would rather like and be able to satisfy as many people as possible or make everybody equally unhappy, I guess. Um, <laughs> Also, improved communication email lists. We were noticing the dev list. People weren't getting emails, or they'd get something in the middle of a conversation, or they'd miss a thread somehow, or a piece of a thread. We've improved that by switching over to another email system. Um, adjustments to hosting um, and unique aspects of firmware to accommodate it. We're, we've moved, we're moving away from uh, SourceForge to GitHub. Um, the, the purpose on that is that SourceForge has some limitations that you can't get entire pieces of things. You can't get standalone binaries because you have to provide source for everything. And some things you just can't get the sources for. So we want to be able to at least provide what we, everything we can and allow for the industry to provide additional options. So in other words, we've becoming more open so you can have the other optional things that occur within the open community. Okay, so the future is now. Let's talk about that. In 10 years, it's the 10-year anniversary of the UEFI, by the way, um, we've grown so much. In 10 more years, in 2025, uh, what can happen? 
But we see that we have an opportunity to still learn more. We're not experts, but we are listening, we are learning. We can grow, we can change, we can adapt. In the end, we're going to be better. And part of that is having the community with us. Um, so those are the, that is the history. And then we talk about learning and growth with UEFI. I thought there was a slide in between here um, that got removed and edited, apparently. Uh, security is one of the big areas that everybody's talking about right now. Uh, last discussion was about HTTP and HTTPS booting. We're looking at the security. It's a very important element of things. In the firmware, um, we see platform threats that can come in the following mechanisms, from BIOS malware, hardware trojans, evil made, ACPI root kits, SMM root kits, that's kind of terrifying, and even UEFI root kits, um, and other type of device malware and option on malware. So there's all sorts of things that can be an attack in a system. The problem is, you put a good lock on a door, if the door is not put in a good wall, are you really secure? <laughs> um, and that's what happens. A lot of people think, oh, I put a good lock on. And they're not realizing, um, yeah, somebody with a little bit of athletic ability or just a lot of courage can defeat your security system pretty quickly. Um, so let's take a look at the boot process. This is the UEFI boot, boot sequence, starting from the SEC phase, the first instruction execution, establishing the root of trust, um, all the way through to the operating system runtime and even the afterlife as the operating system goes down and the reboot comes back around again. We notice that there are certain areas that would be most prone to attack, impact, and oh, that could hurt. Somebody gets in on the boot vector or in the sec before any root of trust is established, you got a problem. Slipping something into a device driver, maybe as an OEM driver, or along those lines, another area of attack. Of course, as you're loading the OS, somebody gets into the loader. That's still within the boot process. That's another area of attack. And of course, we all love and are terrified of the idea of an SMM uh, attack that succeeds. Okay. So we talk about security. There are three things we focus on whether we protect, detect, or recover from the attack. Um, I, I tend to think of different items. For instance, um, protect and detect, I think of a big old guard dog, because he's going to detect things, because he's got those senses, and, he'll, and he will protect. But he's not really going to help you very much with recovery unless petting a dog is a recoverable element. While a fire truck will not help you do much for detecting, but it really helps with recovery or at least minimizing threat. So you can see how the, the, the circle works and the vectors work. And some of the things that have been discussed within the UEFI. First of all, UEFI Secure Boot, TCG Drust to Boot. Within Secure Boot, UEFI an authentic loader with a public key and policy. Um, check the signature before loading so you make sure things are happening. And the UEFI Secure Boot will stop the platform if the signatures are invalid. Um, UEFI will require mediation if the boot fails. In other words, OK, if it's good, I know what to do. I use it. If it's bad, now what do I do? Becomes the question mark. Um, UEFI PI will measure the OS loader on the, the trusted boot, will measure the OS loader and drivers into TPM and check, their and check their configuration register. The process goes with checking and everything. Um, a TCG trusted boot will never fail. There's a lot of measurement happening, more policy associated, incumbent upon the software to make security decisions using the attestation. So while these can work hand in hand, you can see that there are differences because people get them mixed and managed and they're trying to figure out which is which. Um, and for open source content, tiantacore.org, UDK 20 fail, uh, 
2014 is available. 2015 is either coming soon or is out like in the last day or so. So um, the 2015 is based on the specifications that are currently published. Um, the original, the original um, definition of the date was supposed to be, or originally was, every spec that was available as of January 1st of that year will be supported in, of the UEFI specs will be supported, PI spec, UEFI spec, et cetera, in that version. So 2015 would be everything that was available January 1st. Next version that comes out this year, that would actually be in the 2016 or along that line. Okay. Okay, UEFI development kit, 2014 security package. These are the things that are in the 2014 package. Random number generator, trusted computing group support, the PEI modules that do this, user identification, the library, variable authentication, and there is where you can find it on uh, the EDK part in SVN, unfortunately, it's still MontanaCore.org. Additional capabilities, variable locking, lockbox, capsule update, recovery, and locations where you can find the reference code for that. Um, are there any questions on this? Because those are things from the UEFI spec. I'm, I'm taking that everybody's familiar with this. So if there are questions, feel free to jump in. Um, raise your hand. Yeah, shout out, whatever. Um, I'm fairly open to that, and I'm not easily scared. So, um, yes. Please feel free to dismiss this as off topic. With the RNG protocol, the random number generator, mm -hmm. how much entropy does it actually generate? Because I couldn't find in the spec how many bits of entropy there are for bits of data. You know, actually, I don't know. I, I <laughs> you got a really technical question, and I, I'm not that. And so I'm not going to say it's off topic. I'm just going to say I don't have an answer for you. I can talk to the people and find out. Yeah, we need that. yeah, that's why Vincent, if Vincent were here, he'd be taking over right now. Yeah. Okay. Code management. Um, analyze the microstone references we input or the attacker inside the code itself in the code actually comments saying, hey, these are things and these are places where vulnerabilities could exist. Um, and why it's, how it's protecting against that. In the UEFI development kit 2015, there are examples of this in the GPT. So you can actually see that the code is being looked at from a security standpoint as well within the open source implementation so that we can identify fully verified boot sequence, other elements in UEFI, um, where we things can occur, measurements can be made to ensure and the, where these kind of measurements occur within the boot process. So inside the CPU, after this has been run and the, the CPU is initialized, the PI phase, policy engine and policy using boot guard. Here, start block of the PEI before you get into Dixie, another place, the OEMPI verification. In the BIOS and in the executable, the, the um, Dixie stage and the UEFI stage, UEFI 2.4 secure boot, chapters of the spec. This type of measurement can be done here. Then it gets over to the OS with the, after these measurements and during these measurements so that at this point, your root of trust, your trust chain is validated through these policies all through the boot process. <clears throat> Again, link for the example. Now, these slides, by the way, are going to be published um, for this convention. They're also being published on the UEFI.org website. So you don't have to rush down and write all these URLs and everything. But we're including those, so if you want to go back and look at them, you can get them and look at them. You know, pull the slides up and take a look and go to those locations. So, in conclusion, about UEFI, 
from the beginning of this discussion. We're about standards. We're about evolving evolution and growth in the areas like security and technology, practices and interactions. Um, we're about cooperation and we are about community. One of the things that I want to say on the community point is, is that we realize that the Linux community is a community that's been around for a long time. And we're a community that's been around for a shorter time, but we are a community. And actually there's overlap between the two. There are many members of the Linux community that are members of the UEFI community. And we see that as a strength for both of our communities. And we're open to the communication between. Because in the end, really both of us are about protecting the interests of the entire ecosystem and for UEFI in the firmware space, Linux community you know, in general. Um, and actually we're kind of in general too, but we know our specialty is in the firmware space. So are there any questions?